Hello, and welcome to another edition of Interviewing the Legends, brought to you by the Publicity Works Agency, devoted to promoting musicians and authors worldwide. Call us today at 941 877 one five five two to start your free publicity evaluation. Remember, we shine only when we make you shine. Please welcome the host of Interviewing the Legends, music journalist, author, and entrepreneur, Ray Shasho. Hello once again, everybody. I'm your host, Ray Shasho, and welcome to another edition of Interviewing the Legends on BBS Radio, brought to you by the Publicity Works Agency. Call us today at 941-877-1552 or email us at publicityworksagency.com. Remember, we shine only when we make you shine. Leo Lyons became a professional musician at the age of 16 and as a founding member of the band 10 years after, has been an on-stage eyewitness to some of the most pivotal moments in rock and roll history. 1967, 10 years after, he held a re- residency at London's famous Marquee Club and a debut album out on Durham Records, and the band were soon to build up a huge following in Europe. Fillmore West and Fillmore East founder Bill Graham heard a copy of the band's first album and immediately sent a letter offering to book 10 years after into his historic venues in San Francisco and New York. They were also one of the first rock groups to be part of the Newport Jazz Festival uh, at Newport and on tour 10 years after performed with Nina Simone, Roland Kirk, Miles Davis, and other jazz legends brainstorming across the U.S., Their now legendary encore, I'm Going Home, was captured on film at the Woodstock Music and Arts Festival, exposing their jazz, blues, rock, amalgam to an even larger audience of moviegoers who were blown away by the intensity of the band's performance when the Academy Award-winning documentary was released. Their 10-minute appearance in the film is an acknowledged highlight and established 10 years after a place in rock history. The band's albums are still available and all all have reached gold or platinum status. Leo has produced records for such music legends as UFO, Procol Harum, Motorhead, and many, many more. In 2003, 10 years after, reformed yet again, this time with the new guitarist singer Joe Cooch, replacing Alvin Lee. And for the past seven years, aside from writing and producing, Leo has recorded three CDs and toured the world with 10 years after. In the summer of 2010, together with 10 years after guitarist Joe Gooch, he formed 170 Split, a new, exciting, high-energy blues rock power trio showcasing their combined talents. Leo and Joe resigned from 10 years after at the end of 2013, and to celebrate a new beginning, 170 Split released a new CD simply titled HSS, followed by The Road two years later. Their live shows have already proved popular with 10 years after fans. HSS play 10 years after classics along new material in their shows. 170 Split was formed to play music that rocks outside of the 10 years after box. Please welcome bass guitarist, songwriter, and record producer Leo Lyons to interviewing the legends. Hello, Leo. Welcome. Hi, Ray. Thanks for the build-up. That's wonderful. Um, hello to everybody. Hello to everybody there out in state side. Well, we miss you over here. You know, 10 years after he has that reputation of sometimes, you know, being in Europe, you know, and doing shows across the sea. And another band that's like that is uh, Status Quo. We never get to see that band either. No, I don't think Status Quo worked that much in the States, did no. they? But uh, certainly 10 years after did. I mean, God, it was a second home. I, I think, you know, in the early days we were doing like 30 weeks, 36 week tours, you know, three times 10 week, 12 week tours of America. And of course, I lived in America myself for 15 years. You lived in, so, uh, you lived in Nashville, right? 
I did, yes. I, I, I went there, I think, 98. Yeah, I think it was 98. As, as a songwriter, not, uh, not as a touring musician, but... Um, so, I've got a very fond spot for America. Well, Nashville's a great place. There's a lot of great... Uh players there you know great session players and and there's still still are it's a great great town uh what what what, yeah. what, did, what did you do exactly you said you were songwriting what what was your process back then when you lived in nashville um well i was writing I, it, it, there was a bit of a lull in the, in the type of music that that i was known for in the uk and i, I was writing songs and, and um i decided that i would fly over to nashville with some of my songs walk up and down music row and see if i could get anyone interested and um she gave me a staff writing deal, so I moved to America on, you know, on the basis of that, and uh, would go in into my office every day and write songs. How, and, uh, how uh, for a, a number of years before I went back on the road again. How how, uh, how tough was that to you know sit down and just create music like that? It's, it is very it's very difficult. I mean the way the way worked in Nashville was you, you would you would co-write with people because that gave you a little bit more stimulation than sitting there on your own doing it. And for me, it was a, I mean, a wonderful experience, a great learning process. As you say, some of the best writers, some of the best music, musicians in the world either live in Nashville or pass through Nashville. And I, I got a lot of friends and I learned a lot. Alvin said to me, what do you want to move to Nashville for? And, you know, they're all great players there. And I said, well, that's the reason, Alvin. <laughs> <laughs> well, Al, 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 Alvin was one of my favorite guitars, and I was very fortunate to hang out with him uh, backstage at uh, in D.C. during the Best of British Blues tour. That was uh, it was Alvin Lee, Eric Burden. Uh, they had guys like uh, Ansley Dunbar, uh, Mickey Moody was on the tour, Boz Burrell, Tim Hickley. It, it, it was awesome, and. Uh, Alvin was such a great guy. He signed my guitar. He said he even played it for a while. Um, it, it, you know, he was he was fantastic on stage, and I was I was really heartbroken when when he passed away. Yes, it was. It was for me. It was a shock because, of course, he and I worked together. I think he was fifteen. I was sixteen. So. Right. That goes back a long way. It's very strange. Um, it, very strange. He was, was like the brother I never had. You know. Right. Very strange and sad the way he passed away too, because it was supposed to be kind of a simple procedure. Is what I understand, you know. It was, yes. I don't know. I don't know the details about it. I really wouldn't want to talk about the details on the radio show. But yes, it was a shock. It was a shock to everyone. Well, I like that. Unexpected. Yeah. He, he's he's very very. I was actually on tour in Germany with with my band Hundred Seventy Split, and I. And I I got a, 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 a text or an email, I think, from from someone in the music business. It's so sad to hear about Alvin. And I thought, what is this? It's, it's got to be a hoax. You know, there's so many hoaxes right. out on there. Um, and um, I checked it out and I'm sure it was true. It, you know, all, all the legends, you know, that we we grew up with. You know, it's it's you know, it, I, I just find it hard. To, to see him go away, you like that, you know? It's 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 it is very tough. And I I, I saw you in that documentary with Johnny Winter, you know? Oh that, yes. Yep. Yeah, I'm I'm at the sharp end of people disappearing. You know, it's even <laughs> scarier for me. <laughs> every time, you know, every other day, if someone I know has passed over. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, Paul, um, I guess it's that age, isn't it? I I well, I, some of these guys are are dying pretty young too. You know, like the guys from yeah, the '90s. That's the story. I mean, it is. I'm 75. That's pretty old. 25 would have been old 50 years ago. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's still guys out there like uh, John Mayall. He's in his 80s now, and he, he's. John, yeah, he is. That's yeah. Right. Same and, birthday as me, 30th of November. Is that right? I didn't know that. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. I didn't know till I found out. <laughs> Somebody told me. John, I covered John here in Sarasota uh, for his 80th birthday, and I got to hang out with John Mayall as well. He, he, he not only does he play, still play, but he sets up his own um, equipment as well. I mean, I, I got. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, 
yes, John's always been an interesting character, I think. And, you know, one of the first guys to bring to, to champion the blues in the UK, yep. him and Alex's corner. Well, well, thanks, thanks to the Brits, they brought blues back. You know, it, it went away, and then the the, the the Brits brought it back. Which, you know, well, I think I think it was it, it was a strange thing because in 1956, some of those um, black American blues players came over to Europe, thanks to the you know the promoters, German promoters, Lippmann, Rau, like uh, Muddy Waters, Howling Wolf, Sonny Terry Brown, and McGee, and they were we we all idolized those people. We loved it, and we, I didn't realize that it wasn't the same in America. The radio was different. Um, there was, you know, there was obviously there was race radio, and that was all you heard it on. And I think middle class white American, young American, young British guitar players and bands went over to America and played, played that, you know, what really is American heritage music. When did you first? Because uh, what I understand, I, I talked to Kim Simmons about the blues and and about England, about England, you know, first uh, being introduced to uh, American R and B and that kind of stuff. Uh, what what was the first time you started hearing, I guess, American music, rock and roll and stuff? Because I, what I understand, the BBC did not play; they only had like classical music at the time, right? No. No, there was there was a radio station called Radio Luxembourg, right? Which you could, which was a, a, a I guess you would call it a medium wave station or, or short wave station. You could you could only pick it up at night in the UK, and it was a, it was a disappearing signal. But they were playing rock music, so it would you know it, it was it was Chuck Berry, Little Richard, Elvis, um, you know that that kind of stuff, and a lot of ballad pop. Pat Boone type stuff, but it was it was Little Richard and Chuck Berry and Elvis, uh, um, Gene Vincent, Barrett Strong, that kind of thing, rock and roll thing, and then latterly I kind of went from there into the blues, and I think in I was in Alvin and I were in Germany in 1962, and there was Germany Hamburg was it was a a port town, and a lot of American sailors were coming through, bringing, bringing, you know, black music, and um, he kind of got into that there. And the same thing happened in Liverpool. Any port town where was where where new musical stuff came over from the states, you, you, and then it, it kind of spread from there. So yeah, it's amazing how Hamburg always comes up. You know, back back from the yeah. early days. musician, I think, or at least it was in the 60s. Um, I mean, we played, Alvin and I played there, I think we did six weeks there, and we would play, you play sort of an hour on, an hour off, six, seven hours a night, you, you learn to uh, stretch out the songs. Um, it was great, it was a formative time, and uh, without that, I don't think, certainly Alvin and I would not have been as successful as we were, and I could probably say that about the Beatles and many, many other musicians. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Well, I tell you one thing. I love your band, uh, 170 Split, and uh, I I gave the the uh, the uh, the album tracks five stars because I I fell in love with the album. Uh, Thank you. Usually, I highlight the, the the tracks I like on each album, and I highlighted every track on this album. <laughs> which one have you got? Right. Uh, tracks. Which, no, which album do you have? Uh, the, uh, isn't it called Tracks, the album? Oh, tra Tracks, yeah, that's the latest one. Yeah, Tracks. Yeah, we, that's our one, two, three, four, fourth record, yeah. Oh, it's incredible. Oh, thank you. But you must send me your, email me your address, or I'll send you the others. Oh, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Uh, the current band... We're is enjoying it. I mean, the idea, we, really, it's a continuation of my musical career, the right. other thing that Alvin and I started years and years ago, and I'm lucky to be working with um, Joe Gooch and, and uh, Damon Sawyer, um, two great musicians, and um, we're having one hell of a time. Well, you know, it's such a polished album. You know, it's 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 very mature. You, you can tell you got some, uh, you know, it. You know, y your your background is definitely an influence on this album. And uh, I, yeah, I, I suppose it is. I, I am what I am, and I, I play 
you know, from from my heart, <laughs> not from my head. And uh, I, I guess it, I guess it's me uh, and two other guys. Yeah. <laughs> well, the, uh... I worked in Nashville, you know. I I, I kind of. I, mostly I was writing, but I, because I engineered and produced, I, I right. would do demos and things for people. And um, I remember one time I got a call to go up to New York to produce a record with um, Leslie West. Oh, wow. And um, I went up there, and, and I guess I'd been influenced by Nashville, because when I got there, Leslie said, oh, and you're playing bass on it as well. And I said, okay, okay. And so I, I played bass, and I, I did the real tasteful thing. Um play for the song, keep it down, change it a little bit in the middle, change it a little bit in the chorus, you know, a good polished bass part. And he said, no, 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 I thought you'd play over the top like you did with 10 years after. And I thought, well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess that's the basis of my style, like it or not, playing over the top. But at least I think it's honest. I play what I feel. Uh, it's a, and hopefully, hopefully I've got better. But. I think you did that, much, much better. Uh, not, not that you were already great, but you, you can tell over the years that you know how uh, you know you've learned a few new tricks, I guess. <laughs> yes, there are so many great musicians now around, aren't they? I mean, you know, living in Nashville was a, was a good thing for me too. But uh, with the internet, you can watch a video of some guy playing and, and learn every lick that he's got. Yeah. I mean, when I when I started, it was listening to a record and kind of thinking, well, maybe that's what they played. I'm not sure. In, in a way, you develop your own style by doing that. I think. How did you record this album? Because uh, there's a lot of different ways to record nowadays. Well, we we always try to do do it live. I mean, the thing that I think is most important with with that type of music, and it does depend on the type of music, but with the type of music that we're doing, is to capture the energy of it, the spirit of it. Right. So we try to do everything as live as possible, and then if there's something wrong, just pick it up. You know, if there's a, if there's a, a wrong bass note or, or you know, or something like that, then maybe we can pick it up and and just run a few takes till someone says, "I don't think I can do it any, any better than that." And then that's 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 the basis of the record. And, you know, in the studio situation, being a three-piece, we may augment it with, with, in the case of tracks, we put we put a little bit of extra guitar on and, and um, had a guest, Billy Livesey, to put some Hammond on the, on the songs. Um, and that's how it goes. And, and from my point of view, I'd rather work as quickly as possible because there are so many things you can do, you can disappear doing it, you know. And I don't like that. I, I like to work quickly. Yeah, I, I agree with you. You know, just let, let's get it done. Uh, you know, if it sounds good on the first take, you know, let's 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 do it. <laughs> there are a million ways, a million ways to do it. Um, I think on tracks we did two versions of one song. I think it was tracks, or maybe it was HSS. I can't remember, but um, because we got two, we done it. We tried it two different ways, and thought, oh well, yeah, okay, put them both on. Um, but yeah, this is, and the songs develop, they change. We could probably go in and record the song again, the songs again, and they'd be slightly different. Um, we did a little um, acoustic showcase last month when we were in Germany, and I thought that that would be good. We could do we could do a, an acoustic uh, CD um, at, at those songs, and they'd be different again. So it's fun. I mean. What I'm, what I'm enjoying is working with people that, that I really like and, and, and I appreciate as musicians and, and enjoying things, you know. Right. So uh, that's, that's kind of where we're at. I think this next year, as you probably know, is uh, the 50-year anniversary of Woodstock. So I think what we're going to do with 170 Split is we're going to do the 10 years after 1969 Woodstock. So we'll do two shows, basically. Oh, great. Um, we'll do that, and then we'll do our own thing. Um, so it'll be like two bands. Awesome. I'm not sure who's going to headline yet, but <laughs> we'll see. Whether, we'll, whether the HSS will open, and we'll do the 10 years after second or the other way around. I'll right. see, what, see what the fans want, but um, that'll be a fun thing to do. Well, back to the album real quick. Some of the some of the tunes I really liked. Uh, you know, that, like I said, I liked them all. Grave Digger, 
uh, had a, oh, yeah. a it kind of started like a, it reminded me a little bit of the Almond Brothers, the melody, you know. Yeah, maybe so. Yeah, I mean, it, it's my father was a great digger. It kind of that's really <laughs> I kind of came up. That work. I co-wrote the song with with Joe and with a, a long friend, long-term friend, Fred Cole in right. Nashville, and um, that's how we came up with the. You know, you think about the title, but it is about life, not about my father. But uh, it, it, yeah, it, it's it, an interesting one. It's, it's probably slightly different to right. some of the other things we did. Joe's a great guitar player and you know, great singer as well. He's he's brilliant. He's yeah. absolutely brilliant. He's very un- underrated and yep. one of one of the most uh, the person that underrates he underrates himself. I think he's a very very modest guy. I some of the other track. I grew up on muddy waters. What what a cool title to that, huh? <laughs> well, yeah. Well, that's how it was, you know. Like, <laughs> muddy waters and Newport was was a, a big, you know, the, the album was a big influence on on both Alvin and myself. So, and I, I just loved it. Sometimes joking. Love, love the energy of it. Love yep. love the way you know it all came together. Sometimes Joe can sound a little bit like Paul Rogers. I don't know if you get that or not. But I, I, he would be incredibly flat. <laughs> I, I, I hear Paul in his <laughs> voice. <laughs> Paul's, you know, Paul's got a great voice. Absolutely fantastic. Um, I, I'm sure. I, I, well, I know I've met him because I think when we in the early days when they were um, free. Yep. Um, they did some. Actually, when before they were called. Black Cat Bones, I think they did some shows with 10 years, well, yeah, it was 10 years after. Yeah. So I met him and I, I thought, I thought they were, he was great, great singer. Well, I love the album. In, in that genre, one of the best. Yeah, exactly. And, and I hear a little Bad Company in the tune, uh, The Game, as well. I think Oh, it, yeah. I, actually, I hadn't thought about that. that. Um, <laughs> It, it's just a, um, you know, it's a track that kind of reminds you of those days, I guess, you know? Back yeah, in the, the oh, maybe I'm writing from experience. Oh, the old. <laughs> 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 I, I, uh, I guess 50, how long? Maybe 50, 60 years, I guess. Amazing. Amazing <laughs> how time listening flies. To, listening to music, I guess you get. Yeah. You, have a, you go back a long way. Some of the other tracks, She's Got the Mojo is a fun track. It's uh, a great boogie and blues song. Uh, Lonely, another another one with an incredible guitar. Joe's awesome on Lonely. Uh, yes, yes. Joe, Joe wrote that one himself, that particular Really? Song. Yeah. Final Curtain's a heavy rocker. You know, it comes out right out of the gate, you know, rocking. Great, great song. Um uh, can you talk about the uh, the track You Can't Drink It? Yep. What's that one all, um, all about? It's, it, yeah, it's a, it, it's, a, it's a lost love song. Okay. <laughs> I guess is what, is what it, that's all about. When you've got the blues over, over, over losing your woman. Uh, most things are about that, aren't they? Most of the blues, you feel good, you feel bad, you feel right. sick, you've been lost, you know. Yeah, very true. <laughs> yeah. I think Alvin Lee said a guitar is, is very much like a woman, only I guess the guitar acts nicer and better than a, a, a woman. or <laughs> Something like that is what he said. <laughs> well, they can both, both make you feel good. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, guess a, I guess a guitar, I, I don't know. I, I've always taken great comfort from... Um, Playing music, playing guitar, you know, if I feel a little, a little bit down, I, I can pick up the guitar and cheer myself up, so. Yep. And I think that's what music's all about, isn't it? To, you know, to, to, to have some sort of impact. It, it can make, a song can make you feel sad, happy, or, or, you know, in many, many, many emotions, I think. And, I, and when we play live, you know, you, you get that feeling from people, you know, that you that they're, they're part of the experience and, and a very important part of the audience, I think. Um, you know, we work and we, we say it wouldn't be the same, you know, without you, you know, people. Yeah. People come 
coming along and joining in. Well, I think the the very more important thing about music, um, it you know timelines your life, and that's that's you know you 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 know you play a, a ten years after song. And you go back and say, yeah, I remember that. I was in high school, and I, I know exactly what I was doing when that song came out, you know, that kind of thing. It's, uh, yeah, that's right. And that, I mean, that's right with, it, with, with any music that, that we've all experienced. Um, and people say that to me all, all the time. I, right. you know, I saw you in 1970, do you remember? And, and <laughs> the song and so on and so forth. Quite surprising. And um, I'm, I'm always quite surprised that, where people are in their lives, you know, whether, whether they're um, judges, lawyers, policemen, right. politicians, or whatever, that they, their music they've enjoyed at some time or other, the music that I've been involved with. And it, it sometimes, it, it, it's very pleasing, but it sometimes makes me think, what? <laughs> <laughs> strange, really strange. Well, you guys are, uh, f- first I wanted to say, you got a really hot DVD out there too, right? Uh, it, is it live from uh, Luxembourg? From uh, oh yes, yes. That, yeah. That, uh, yeah, there, there was two. There was, a, there was a, um, one called Live from the Rock Hall, Luxembourg, right. and then there was a TV show, um, Rock Palace TV. Those are the couple that were out. We're, we're actually we really should have done another one, but because um, they're probably five, six, seven years old now, but um, we haven't got around to doing it. And we, we, did, we attempted to do a live DV, and, and there were some technical problems um, with, the, with the recording. And, and uh, in the end, we couldn't... Uh, actually, it wasn't the recording, it was the camera. There was camera shake on some one of the main cameras. They didn't uh, oh. fix it down, and the audience kept banging into it, and people, they couldn't use it. So we do another one. But that's, that's out there now. There's a lot of iPhone stuff on, on yeah. the Internet, which... May or may not give people an idea. I mean, to me, I, I sometimes freak out and think, God, that sounds awful, but of course it would on an iPhone. Yeah, unfortunately, that's, uh, yeah, a, a lot of musicians are worried about that because it shows up on YouTube, you know, and, and, oh, yes. and the All quality. The <laughs> yeah, then they think you sound like that and you don't. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, we, we do have a good sound, man, and most of the time, even on an iPhone, it, it, it sounds, what shall I say, it, it's almost representative of what we're doing. <laughs> but, uh, no, I think a good DVD, DVD is long overdue for under 70 split. Right. The, uh, you, you have a tour coming up, January 12th, I think. Uh, you'll be... Yeah, we're I mean, yeah. we, we just came off a month tour. We, we were in Europe for the, for the whole month of October, and then we've got time off. And on the 12th, I'm doing a one-off show with some Danish musicians right. celebrating the Woodstock thing. And then I'm, after that, the day after that, I'm doing two shows with 170 split, all, all in Denmark. And then the next run, the major run after that, is in March, where we'll be touring mostly Germany. And then throughout the year, we'll be doing festivals in various parts of Europe. And in October, again, we're on the road for October and into mid-November, six weeks on the road. So it's, it's quite a lot of shows. And, and I was kind of hoping to, that some U.S. dates would come in. Um, the problem is, is visas, you know. I, right. I, I'm not an American resident anymore, and every time I want to work, I have to get a visa. Oh. And um, there are two people, I think, in the American Embassy in London that hand out visas to uh, entertain us, and you can imagine how long I wait to, to, to get a, a visa. So it was about 160 days. Wow to process and it's proved difficult last year I had some shows in America couldn't get the visa through in time and had to cancel them so hmm. we'll see maybe um, maybe maybe with the Woodstock Festival someone will say actually that guy was there and um, he's in the Library of Congress so maybe we can fast track his visa and give him a visa within three or four weeks of him applying <laughs> we'll see you, you should have became a citizen This you could have had what dual citizenship here in England? Uh, yeah, I had a green card. Right. And I, 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 lived, I was a resident for 15 years, so I, yes, I could. After five years, I could have had dual citizenship. Right, right. 
Uh, and that, but you know, it's so complicated. You get to a certain time in your life, and I, I, I felt I had a home in Nashville, and we, we, we had, you know, family here. Right. And um, <laughs> I felt like I was living out of a suitcase. <laughs> right. I didn't feel as if I'd got any roots, and you know, I was thinking it, it sounds very depressing and negative in a way. But as you get older, you think about what happens if I if I shuffle off this mortal coil. I'm going to leave one hell of a mess for my family to sort out, having right. you know having a foot in two countries. So I decided that maybe I should you know move and, and give up my green card and come back to to the soil that I was grew up in. You know. Well, you must like touring because you're still doing it. And you still do a lot of it. <laughs> ah, yes. <laughs> Yeah. There's no other reason. I don't need to do it. I don't need to do it for a living. Right. Um, people say, even my own, my family are very supportive. They realize that I need to do it. But, yeah. you know, my son said, well, you can do what you like now. What, what do you want to do? Go on holiday, do this, do that. And I said, well, I, I like to play. I like to go out and play live. And uh, so that's what we do. And um, I guess I'll do that until I feel that I'm, I, I'm not capable of doing it. Yeah, there's there's a couple. As long as people want to hear me play, (laughs) (laughs) it would be sad to go out on tour and no one come. Well, the the good thing about it, you're playing bass, you're a uh, songwriter, uh, producer, engineer, and you got somebody else singing, and you got somebody else young singing. (laughs) Yes, yes, that's right. So you won't lose your voice. That's one thing. I I I I don't want to sing, right? But I'm I'm not a very good singer, and that's really been annoyed me for all my life. I I decided this year actually that um, I would have singing lessons, so I have taken singing lessons. Oh, good. Um, Not not to sing on stage, but so that I can present the songs that I write in a better format than uh, than I have in the past. Sure. And, And I'm finding that fun. I do like singing. My um, great uncle was a professional opera singer, so in a way, if it's in the bloodline, there's no excuse I shouldn't be able to sing. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> both, both my sons sing, so <laughs> it must have come through somewhere. I, inhibition, you know, most people. I sometimes I surprise myself, and I surprise myself so much that all of a sudden I lose it again. <laughs> <laughs> but there was a time, I think what, many, many years ago, when we, Alvin and I started out in a band called the Jaybirds, and right. we had to go in hos- into hospital with, a, with an app- 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 appendicitis. Right. And we needed the money, had to keep going, so we kept going, and I did sing in the band for a time. But um, I, needed, I needed at least half a bottle of whiskey <laughs> to do it. And, uh, I think it may have been pretty awful. I don't know. <laughs> well, it all starts in the shower, right? <laughs> it does, yeah. yeah. But I think my wife would complain about the noise. <laughs> Well, I admire you for being a great, also a great producer, and I guess you're an engineer as well. If you're a producer, I guess you have to be an engineer pretty much, right? Well, not necessarily. It right. does help to be able to say, actually, this is the sound I want. Right. And to be able to do it. I mean, a lot of a lot of engineers, uh, an engineer gets to say, he knows how to the recording technique and he knows how to get the sound and... and he chooses the right paint, if you like, for the picture, but the, the subject of the picture is the producer oversees everything. He, 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 the producer has to get the best out of the artist, I think. Sometimes the producer will write all the songs and tell the artist what to play, but I, I didn't like to do that. I, I'd work with a band or an artist that I thought was really good and try and help them get, get over what they wanted to say in the studio. Um, and, you know, some engineers become producers and some producers fall into being engineers because of the frustration of not being able to get the sound they they hear in their heads. Right. Um, I was kind of one of those. I um, I produced before. I, I mean, I I always en- enjoyed the, the the recording process. I've always had tape recorders and I've always had a little home studio. But I I when I started producing, I, I worked with other engineers, and then I engineered myself, and now I've kind of gone back to working with other engineers again, because it, it's it's hard work engineering, and it's 
tedious, and you've got to be young to do it. <laughs> I'd, I'd rather say, this is the sound I want, and let someone else spend the hours trying to get it for me. Well, the mix, but, the, the, uh, yeah, I love engineering. But the mixing board is so, you know, complex. <laughs> yes. <laughs> My yeah. goodness. But I think the recording process has changed so much now, and I'm mostly computer-based. <clears throat> yeah. And um, you can cut and paste and edit and do right. all sorts of things. You can take a, a, a years producing a record unless unless there's a, someone that stops it because of a budget or there's a deadline. Right. And, and I, I'm a little bit like that in a way. I have to watch myself. I always think I could get that better. That could be better. And you have to say, no, that's good enough. Right, right. I, 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 Forget it. Move on to the next record. Right. Um, and um, that's why I say I like to work as quickly as possible. In, out, done. Don't, no second chances. No. What about if it? What about if? What about if? You know. Yep. That's when oh, you get in really, trouble. You know. Now they, it's like oh. Yep. The, what about the, that bass drum? Sounds a bit weird. Oh, here's three hundred different bass drum samples yep. that you can paste over the track and change the snare drum sound and change this and change that and. Yeah. That's why that's why I guess a, a lot of us like the old records. If you analyze them and say, well, bits are loose, a bit sloppy, that the guitar's out of tune there, and so on and so forth. But the energy, the feeling that comes through is, right. is what, what sells, the, sells the song, I think. I agree with you. Well, you, you produced three of my favorite albums with UFO, Phenomenon, uh, Force It, which yeah. is my favorite, and No Heavy Petting. Uh, yes, that's right. Yeah. Uh, and then I, I went on to do, um, uh, uh, what were they called? Oh, I forgot the name of the band. Um, yeah, they had a, they did another, another band thing with Pete Way and Andy Park and. Right, right. I forget, you know, I forget the name of the band now. I guess they were really successful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I, I did work with them for quite a while, yeah. It's funny because uh, one album by UFO was actually produced by George Martin, No Place to Run. Yeah, I guess. Yes, he, that's right, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, there was this, this big thing in America, in, in, in the record label at the time, thinking what we need is to have a breakthrough into the States and we need to um, find, you know, a, a big name producer because that will, that will get the airplay. And, and right, right. That's how George became involved. And I was working with George at the time. I, in fact, for a time, um, a, guy, a guy called John Burgess, who was another great record producer, was managed was George's manager, and he uh -huh. managed me for the time. So I, I knew um, I talked with George about uh, his his experience with UFO. Yeah, UFO was a great band. They were they're, they're, and they're still going on with with different players. They are a great yeah. band. Yeah. I saw on um, YouTube the other day, um, right. I think uh, from a recent tour, I was watching uh, watching the band, and I thought, yeah, they're great. You, you were I think Phil Moggs, I think mm -hmm. Phil said this, uh, this is his last year, he's going to retire. Oh, really? Huh. Whether that's true, I don't know. But I, I think I said. heard something about that, too. Yeah. Yeah. I haven't, I haven't spoken to Phil for a while, I, I mean, it may be four, four or five years since I last saw him. But um, the lady that runs my website runs their website, so we're, we're always, oh, Phil says to say hi, or what are you guys doing? So I, I kind of keep in touch with what they're up to. I, I'm going to mention... Ask me to manage them. Mm. I mean, around the time of Forced or Phenomenon, they asked me to manage them. Oh, really? And I did I did for a few weeks. <laughs> <laughs> a whole that is a tough job. Management is a tough job. It's, yeah. the, it's the dark side, I think, but it's a tough job. <laughs> I uh, I interviewed Vinnie Moore. Vinnie Moore is now in uh, UFO. Yes, that's right. Yeah, yeah great player. Good, good guitar player. Yep. He, he is. Yeah. I didn't work with 
Penny. Of course, I worked with Michael Schenker. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The, the the greatest lineup, yeah. the best lineup. Yep. Yeah. I know you hate talking about Woodstock, and but I've talked to lots of guys that played Woodstock, including uh, you know guys like Greg Rowley, who said the whole, yeah. who said the band was on acid when they did uh, most of their songs. I talked to Melanie, I, you know, I talked to a lot, you know, Paul Katner. I talked to him. But uh, one thing I wanted to ask: Were you when you guys did "I'm Going Home"? Were you in? Yeah. Did you intend to stretch it out like you did, or what? What, what happened there? Because that was, you know, you guys really stretched that song out. It was a great song, and I think it was the hero of Woodstock. But I was wondering if that was planned well, or not. Well, it, 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 the song was. How can I explain it? If you, if you look at the the undead ten years after undead record, which was recorded, the, the second record that we recorded. And it was a live recording from Cook's Creek, right. which was a blue squad next door to the Decker Studios. And we used to do a, we used to do a show, and then we'd go on and do an encore. We'd make a song up, um, and it would be a, basically a jam. Um, and that was I'm Going Home, and the first time we recorded it was on that Undead record. Um, and it was, it was a medley of old rock and roll and a, and a jam. I, where Alvin came up with the guitar intro lick from, I, I honestly don't know. I think it came out of the air like a lot of things. <laughs> um, maybe maybe we were all <laughs> artificially enhanced. I don't know. <laughs> That's where that came about. So, so it was pretty much a, a, a long song by the time we were playing it at Woodstock. And, and again, it was, a, it was an encore. Yeah, yeah. I, I like how he comes out. He yeah. says, "I'm going home I'm by helicopter." Sorry, <laughs> I was going to say, I like how he came out and says, "I'm going home by helicopter." <laughs> yeah, and it was wrong. I stopped flying. Yeah. <laughs> is it right by helicopter? We have to go out by road. <laughs> is it hard to keep up with a guy like Alvin Lee on bass? You know, because no, not really. Because no? we, I, I think I pushed him. <laughs> so it's your fault <laughs> it was my fault I think you know someone said in a book quite recently it looked like they were dueling right exactly and, and about to fight and it's true we, sometimes we did fight <laughs> <laughs> yeah it was it was it was an energy thing it was it's something we had you know we we had to you know, we had to play with such intensity, and we egged each other on. And I pushed, I got behind him and pushed him. So no, it wasn't a. It was just something we we through the years of playing, we, and we both started out. We both enjoyed the same music in the beginning, you know. <clears throat> right. Same roots, same basic roots. This yeah. is the same records. It, it was like. Um, that's how it happened. Well, you guys... Uh, it's a very rare thing, yeah, looking back yep. retrospectively and, and objectively. It's a very rare thing. If you if you have such an empathy with a musician like that, right. it's very rare. And, and, you know, there are lots of others, I suppose, Jagger and Richards and Lennon and McCartney and, and you know, to name a few. But um, not that I'm putting myself um, up against those guys, but you can see there's an empathy of, of the way that people but you know what you know what t t was. 10 years after was an incredible live band and yeah I i'll be honest with you i can't say that about the stones i was very disappointed when i saw the stones back in uh i think it was like 74 or 75 yes. but, but i don't i don't think they're a great live band to be honest with you i'm, I'm you know i i think there are more there are bar bands i can blow out the rolling stones with their music yes i i <laughs> I think the, the, the strength of the Stones was that was what they did in the studio, right? Exactly, certain, and, and the songs are classic songs. Um, that's what's that's that's their strength. I, I I I don't think they went beyond that musically. You know, they um, that's the way they are. They're loose. They develop their own style, and uh, I I still love it, love to hear their music. But I. I you know, I, I'll be honest, I've not seen them play live since 1964, right. I think. I think that was the last time I saw them live. Uh, yeah, that's a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> it is, isn't it? 
Well, so my my two favorite albums by uh, ten years after uh, is it always been uh, Prickwood Green, yep, and the live album, the double live album, which I recorded live. Yeah. Uh, oh, I play that over and over again. It's like that and the Uriah Heap live album were probably my two favorite albums for quite quite a long time. I think yeah, I think ten years after was was a live band. Um, because it was all about energy and, and excitement. Yep. Uh, and perhaps we didn't recreate it. I think we were lazy. We didn't re- We never really rehearsed. We'd go in to, to make a record half rehearsed, you know? Mm-hmm. And um, make it happen in the studio. <laughs> or try to make it happen in the studio. And at the time, I, I thought, I think if we actually rehearsed these songs and sorted them out we could make them better but then maybe then it wouldn't have been 10 years after so right you know I was was making records with with other people at the same time as uh, laterally going in the studio with 10 years after and then it was quite quite a different experience I, I some of the, the some people need to see there's lots of footage of 10 years after um and you and and on youtube and and it's good stuff i mean you got the 25th anniversary of the marquee club in 1983 uh yes i I like that i like that one yeah me too and i saw a um a bass solo that you did on good morning little Schoolgirl. you know which one i'm talking about oh god yes excellent everyone wants to hear that one and we still do we still do it with 170 spit that's awesome you're, you're a I'm great. I think of a way of doing it differently, but I, I, it always falls into the same <laughs> same rut. I can change the bass, but it still falls into the same rut. I can sit at home and work something out. Oh, that's much better. Yeah, I'll do that. And then the minute it goes wrong, bang, it falls into something similar. And sometimes I'm pleased with it. Sometimes I'm not. But uh, people want to hear it, and I'm very happy to play it. Well, Leo, you're a great bass player. You really are. Oh, thank you. Yeah. I, there are some great. Absolutely fantastic bass players around now. I, I, I think I was just lucky, but I, I'd say I'm an enthusiastic bass player. I love what I do. Well, you, you're up there uh, to me. The top top three or four of all time is what I think. Well, I, that's very kind of you. I, know. I, I appreciate that. I I could probably list a, a hundred, but <laughs> I, it's, it's what you know. A musician is either. Incredible, an incredible player technically, right. or a communicator, and and you know the two sometimes go together, sometimes they don't. Sometimes a, a musician that communicates means a lot more to people than 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 someone that just stands there and plays something perfect. Right. Well, um, I mean Hendrix, for example, was an innovative player, and absolutely fantastic, and sometimes he would be brilliant, and right. sometimes he wouldn't be, and I think that's what happens with. A lot of a lot of great players. I think you're right. Well, the the bass player is so important to the band. I mean, a bass player who can't play in time is fairly worthless. And uh, yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd say you're only as good as your drummer. Ex- yeah, exactly. Only as good as your drummer. I mean, drums drums are probably more important now than they were because the, the, the style of sounds sonically now the drums are much more. In, up front in the mix, aren't they? Yes. If you listen to the old rock and roll records, right. you didn't really hear the bass drum that much. Exactly. It had a nice snare drum, and then, then the bass was taking the groove. But now it's kind of switched around a little bit, and now the drums, the drums are up to, up in the front, and the bass mm-hmm. is playing with the drums. So, uh, yeah. Well, you can't have a drummer without a bass player. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Nowadays. Yeah, I think you're right. You, you worked with Lemmy as well, didn't you? Didn't you produce a... Uh, the... Yeah, for a brief period of time. Yeah. Um, we, we went in the studio to make a make a record, and, and the record company didn't pay the bill, and the company went bust, and the album was shelved. Oh, really? Huh. <laughs> I didn't hear that so story. That's what happened, yeah. Wow. Lemmy was quite a character to work with. For sure, um, he could be very intimidating. Really? <laughs> but, uh, 
mean, to be honest, he didn't intimidate me because he said to me before we even worked together that he was a big fan of my playing, blah, 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 blah. So, um, but it was okay. <laughs> <clears throat> I, I heard that a little bit about Ginger Baker as well. <laughs> I wouldn't have Ginger. I wouldn't want to tackle. <laughs> I talked to Jack. Ginger called me up once many, many years ago. When oh. I, I finished with 10 years after, and he said, um, I want to put a band together. Do you fancy being in the band? And I thought, well, no, from what I, I'm not really sure, Ginger. And he said, oh, well, yeah, let's get together. We'll go to Dingwalls, which is a club in London. Right. And um, well, after, when the club closes about 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock in the morning, we'll all get together and play. And I thought, it sounds like it's a crazy thing. And, and you know, we've all seen the Mr. Baker film. Um, <laughs> so I, I think it's probably a good, good, I don't think I would have lasted very long with Ginger. <laughs> yeah, probably not mesh very well, right? <laughs> Yeah, Jack Bruce told me, Jack Bruce told me. Him and Jack playing. Yeah. I guess 1960, playing together in 1960, backing um, pop artists. Right. And they're both jazz players, as you know. Yeah, Jack Jack told me, uh, I interviewed him the the year before he passed away. He says that he he didn't have a sense of humor at all. (laughs) Ginger didn't. Right, Ginger didn't have a sense of humor. Jack was funny. I can believe that. I mean, I didn't know. I worked with Cream a few times, but I didn't really know them. <laughs> Jack was actually pretty funny. I, I didn't know he was so funny, but he, he was uh, he was a character. <laughs> yeah, yeah. A very talented player, too. Very, I mean, were, but, I very mean, talented. Jack was a great bass player. Yeah. I understand you're you're into a couple of different uh, things. I, I, I read that you, you like the paranormal, alternative yeah. medicine, yeah. and... Weird story. Um, when I was, when I've always been a psychic, sounds a terrible word. I, when I was young, I saw ghosts. Really? Like, well, I thought were ghosts, which actually were. But um, so uh, I had to come to terms with it. And I was always afraid of the dark as a kid. And right. I lived in a horribly haunted house, basically, and I was seeing things that nobody was talking about. The family mm. which left me um, slightly afraid of the dark until I was in my twenties. Right. And uh, I decided I had to come to terms with it, so I, I enrolled in at, at a college in London called the College of Psychic Studies, just to learn what it was that was happening to me. Excuse me. <laughs> One of the joys of living in Wales right now. <laughs> When you say you saw ghosts, what is it, like, just an apparition of somebody? Was it somebody you knew, or...? No, no. Um, I've seen all, all sorts of things throughout my life, but this really? is a horribly haunted house. Uh-huh. When you were an entity that um, frightened the life out of me. Wow. <laughs> it wasn't until I was in my 20s that I found out that the whole family were experiencing the same thing. Really? That's interesting. Yeah, so it corroborated it. Just when I convinced myself that I was imagining it, they... Yeah, the guy just passed away, right? The uh, announcer. Did, yes. Yeah, um, I haven't. Been, he hasn't been in touch with me since. But uh, yeah, I did his show. Yeah. How about that? Huh? I didn't know that. And one or two others across America. But once every two years, some psychic show in America calls me up, and we do. Yeah. We do a, a psychic interview, which goes more in, into that side of my life than the, the musical side. There's there's a TV show that does that too. They get celebrities. And they go back, people like you that had an experience and, and are still very kind of, you know, sc- very scared of that situation. And they go back to the scene and they recreate it. That, oh, really? Yeah. I'll, I'll email you the uh, the link if I can. That's interesting because 15 years ago, so 
someone said to me, <coughs> I've got this idea for a TV show where you go and you go to a, a celebrity that's being troubled, that lives in a haunted house or something, and we do this TV show of you finding out what it is and helping them. Right. Uh, so I guess it's, it's something like that. It is. It's exactly like that. I'll send you the link. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm trying to think of some of the people that were uh, on there, but they, they were famous people, and they were they were like you. They were dead serious <laughs> and, yeah, af- yeah. and afraid. <laughs> well, you know, you, you've got to experience it yourself, and then question what you've seen, and, and, and make up your own mind. Right. I, I, you can't persuade someone one way or the other. Um, and it took me years. I spent many, many years convincing myself that I was imagining things. Right. Actually, the, the early part of my life, I thought I was going mad. Yeah. Um, you know, when I was 14 or 15, and uh, none of my friends was, you know, seeing seeing these things. Um, but then, you know, when I go, I went to the College of Psychic Studies, and I realized that I wasn't alone, mm-hmm. and it was in a way quite normal. I know I think people are more open to to it. When I was younger, if you started talking away and talking now, people would go, oh, oh, right. this guy's a bit crazy, <laughs> too much dope. <laughs> and I, in actual fact, he put me off. <laughs> I thought if I'm seeing these things, I, the last thing I want to do is to start, you know, tripping on acid. <laughs> yeah, definitely don't want to do that. <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I arrived, we arrived, I, I flew in from the, the Holiday Inn by helicopter and before we played and got down there and I was sitting there in the back of a U-Haul truck and Pete Townsend came over to me and said, whatever you do, don't don't take it, don't eat anything or don't drink anything that's not from a sealed can because I did it and I, last, you know, last night and I got, I got tripped out on acid, so I, I thought, God, I was hungry, but um, I stayed hungry. Yeah, there was a lot of it, you know, you've seen the movie, watch out for the brown acid. <laughs> yeah, I remember that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, uh, strange, strange times. Cor- Corky, you know Corky Lang, right? Mm-hmm. He says he, he uh, on the Woodstock album, I think the album itself... They called him in to do the drums on I'm Going Home because they had a, a problem with the sound or something. Do you know anything about that? I've heard it, yeah. I've heard it, and Corky's told me. Yeah. That they lost the snare drum mic. Right, exactly. Um, it's difficult to tell because I, I've actually got the tape. I've got a rough two-track tape um, from... Woodstock, and quite recently they discovered the eight-track tapes of, of the ten years after set. Hmm. And it, I, I've not got around to checking whether the snare was overdubbed or not yet. But he may have been. He may have been. Rick denies it, but I don't know. Yeah, he says he was the only guy at Woodstock that wasn't really at Woodstock. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't it? That's his claim to fame. I, I, I honestly don't know. I think he said he went into, into RCA and, and dubbed the snare. Right. Yeah, that's what he told me. Yeah. <clears throat> he's a oh, good, I'm sure he probably did. Yeah, he's a good guy. But um, I have to listen to the A track. In fact, I, I know someone that's got the A track. I'll, I'll ask them. Okay. The snare was overdubbed, and we can yep. we can <laughs> we can tell one way or the other on that one. Not that it detracts anything from Rick's playing. But, uh, right, right. Rick's is not happy if you if you suggest. <laughs> it's like saying somebody dubbed my bass, you know. Yeah, I, exactly. I, oh, come on, that's not really fair. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I want to go back to the uh, the, the paranormal stuff. All uh, just a minute. The I want to bring up UFOs. Uh, I, I I had a lengthy talk with Michael Pinder, you know, yeah. the Moody Blues, and he, he saw a lot of stuff. He, he saw like uh, um, a bunch of ships, you know, uh, kind of like um, air, you know, spaceships up in the air. 
And yeah, I mean, it, it, two or three times he's, he's seen, he saw UFOs, which are. Well, I, I mean, we'd be, I think we'd be pretty arrogant to think that we're the only form of intelligence in the universe. Right. We? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm open to it. I, I think I, I've experienced that twice in my life, seeing what I thought was a UFO. Right. Was that in England or in the States? Once in England and right. once in, um, in the Sierra Nevada mountains outside of Fresno. Oh, that would make sense. I was camping out there and um, this thing came hovering down over the, one of the lakes. Huh. Um, whether it was a, you know one of those things from Area 51 or whatever it is. Right. You know, an, a, an, ar- a na- an army, an uh, air force test plane or not, I don't know, but it, it sounded this, exactly the same as the one I heard in the UK. Huh. Like an electric motor. Right, right. Almost as if you turn an electric motor up and then turn it down like a volume. It, that's the, the way it kind of sounds. But I haven't seen aliens as such, or not that I know. They say they walk amongst us, so maybe maybe we all have and don't know. Yeah, they probably uh, they probably look like us, pretty much, you know. Or I think they do. Yeah, yeah. I think some of them are running the government. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're right. <laughs> Some, something is happening in the world. It, it's been happening, been happening for the good what six, seven years. Very strange things. I don't know. Yes, yes. Yeah. Leo, here's yeah, a no. here's a question I ask everybody, and I get some interesting answers. Uh, if you had a field of dreams wish, like the movie, uh, to perform or collaborate with anyone from the past or present, who, who would that be? It's a difficult question. I think I'd like to have been in maybe in Memphis around the time that the, 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 the you know the, the sun sessions were happening. Right, right. I think that would have been an interesting period. I mean, I was fortunate enough in moving to Nashville really to meet a few people that were around at the time and involved in that. I think I'd like to have seen that. Um, but I, you know, I've been very, very lucky. I, I, I think. It, I've been on so I mean, I'm kind of quirky from my my book. I started the book, but I'll never finish it. I've been lucky to. I feel like the Forrest Gump of rock and roll, you know, because <laughs> I was in Hamburg at the time of the Beatles exactly. and San Francisco and Swinging London and Woodstock and all those things. Yeah. And so I I I have been very very lucky to to see that I've been a a participant in in a lots of cases where where all that was happening. So it would be. It would be. The, it would definitely be before that. So it would be the fifties. What was happening in the fifties? I think would have, would be what I'd like to have seen. That's a great story about about the the, the Sun Records and and how they, um, you know, signed Elvis and then uh, sold sold him. I think to RCA for that's correct about twenty five thousand or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you can only you know. Sam was a good a, a good businessman. I guess right. he realised that he could only break Elvis regionally to get to get him to go any further in his career. He needed the distribution, and you know how it all works. Yeah. Um, and that's what happened. Then Sam bought bought shares in Holiday Inns, didn't he? Yes, he did. Yes, he did. So, uh, Very strange that Elvis never toured overseas. You know. <laughs> It, right. Being an, a, a, what do they call them? An, an, an alien, an illegal <laughs> immigrant, or something. <laughs> Not wanting to to to, uh, to move to go out of America for fear of coming back. I don't know. It's, it is strange. I mean, he did he did go to Germany. I, someone told me that he did a little gig somewhere. Oh, really? But I, I don't know how true that is. Yeah. He was uh, what was his nationality? I forgot. He, not he wasn't Turkish. He was I forgot what he was. Mm, I'm not sure. Maybe East European or something. East European or something. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know. I, I, he was afraid. I've he, never met him, so I don't know. Yeah. I saw Elvis once. I did actually see him before. You you must have met um, what's his name, the Led Zeppelin manager, um, Peter. Yeah, Peter. Peter. Peter yeah. 
Yeah. Yes, Peter was a larger than life character. Yep. I, I, I got on really well with Peter. Some people found him a little mm. difficult, but I, 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 he and I got on really well. Um, in fact, at one time, he, he said to me, "If you ever, if you want to leave ten years after, just I'll come and see me. I'll, 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 ma I'll manage and help you put a band together." Huh. And uh, he was great. He was a very good manager. Oh, he was great. He was he was very good at taking care of his uh, his people. You know. Yeah, yeah. Um, but he was. <coughs> I, I, the first time I met him was when he was tour managing Gene Vincent in the UK. Oh wow! Um, and he used to be a wrestler. Yeah, I can see that. <laughs> yeah. And he, he, he went under the name of Count Bruno Elasio. And um, <clears throat> if the, Richard Coles, the Zeppelin's tour manager, used, used to say to me, you know, you're the only guy that can get away with calling in that because I've seen him hit people <laughs> for saying that. But yes, he was, he was quite a quite a character. The first guy that, that, you know, I think the first time that, as far as I know, the first guy that went into a venue when, when the band got, was successful and sold out and got booked back and he, he said okay we'll come back again but we want to do it we want a percentage that's right because most most times it, you know <clears throat> that percentage thing wasn't happening yeah yeah he took care of Zeppelin for sure and uh he did start, yeah. started with the Yardbirds that's right yeah and bad company too bad company too that's right huh that's a that's a great story. Yeah, well, we all we all started out together, so you know, when you do that, you pass cross, you meet each other, and uh... yeah. I, I talked to Jim McCarty. Uh, he he was telling me that uh, let's see, Clapton, Jeff Beck, and Page all lived pretty close to each other in England. Yeah, yes, they did. In, in, in well, uh, Jimmy lived in. Um, Hanley or Goring, Chick, Chick Church or the Cable Blow, we ten years after living yep. in Goring, and, Han, and Jimmy lived just down the road. Clapton was in Hanley or Berkshire, let's put it that way. Mm -hmm. Berkshire, Oxfordshire border would be where, they, where everybody lived. It seemed to be a rock and roll uh, area that people moved to. You know, you go to London, you make a lot of money, and then you move out to the country. It was right. like that, that era. Mm -hmm. Well, in Birmingham too, a lot of rockers came from Birmingham. Oh yes, yeah. yeah. That's um, well, it, it, it was always you know when I started out. I, I'm from Nottinghamshire, but Not, when yep. I started out, you always had to go to London, right? Because you know, that was the centre of the music business. If you want to be a successful musician, you moved to London. And Alvin and I moved down there. I think 1960, hmm. 61. Something like that, um, or 1960 maybe, and um, it wasn't really until the Beatles had success out of Liverpool that, that the music business and our people started looking further afield to, to places like Birmingham and uh, right. Sheffield and uh, Scotland, you know, places like that. Wales, some fantastic musicians in Wales, mm. and still is, but. Uh, London's a capital city, but it's not. It, it isn't the be all and end all of, of, of talent. W Wales is really different, isn't it? I mean, I I <clears throat> understand like the the signage, like it is really long words, you know. Yeah, it's a different, it's a different <laughs> country. It's part of the British Isles, but it's a different country. Very it's different. A, it's a different language. It's, it's it's the Welsh language, so everything is in in English and Welsh. And you have to you have to learn Welsh in school. Can you speak Welsh? No. Oh, no. Huh? Actually, a few words. Yeah. <laughs> um, the pronunciation and the way they look is it's such a difficult language. Yeah. Um, in the north of Wales, people tend to speak Welsh more more often. Right. In, in Cardiff, Cardiff, where I live, is the capital city, <laughs> so a lot of people speak. English is the first language, but everything's in English and Welsh. If you go into a bank, it's English or Welsh. Yeah, or anywhere really. 
Very interesting. All signs, all the bills, your electricity bill comes in English and Welsh. Yeah, I remember the uh, Tom Jones show. He always said something in Welsh at the end there. Okay. Yeah. yeah I'm sure he did. Well, Tom, Tom lives just outside of Cardiff. Right. Um, Ponty Prit is where Tom came from. Yeah. Um, it's a land of song, isn't it, really, when you think about it? Some you know, great singers have come from Wales. Oh, fantastic singers. Fantastic singers. And it, it, there's a lot of talent here. But certainly in, in the city of Cardiff, there, there are lots of artsy things going on all the time. I love the history. It's like Nashville, because it's not necessarily a music business place, but yeah. it, it's, it's a pretty good centre for music. Well, the, the history itself of of Wales and and in England, I mean, I, I I'm very much in the castles. So one of these oh, well, one of these days, yeah, you I'll, can't go far wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I think you could do ten castles in an hour. Really? From, from where I live. Wow! I'd love to. I'd, I'd love to spend the night in a castle. I think that'd be great. That's possible. Yeah, that is possible. There are several that you can stay in. Well, Leo, what, what's next? What's next for you? And uh, is there going to be another uh, recording and a new album coming yes, out? Yes, there is. I'm, I'm thinking of maybe recording the ten years after 1969 Woodstock set. Awesome. If we get time to just to do that, because a lot of fans would like it. Yep. And and we're working on a new studio album too, but that probably won't come out until October now. Oh, fantastic! And as I said, I'd also like to do an unplugged record. Yep. Of course, he's fitting all that in, but um, that's what I'd like to do. Um, I've got the time, but uh, it's it's get all organizing everyone to do it. People do go off and do different things, you know, in between exactly. the tours. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, keep keep doing something new. I'm guesting with some Danish musicians. Um, for one show next month, and, and we are doing doing the t- ten years after Woodstock songs, so that'll be interesting working with some international musicians uh, that I've not met before and don't know. Well, it's it's always a learning process, you know, when you when you play with <laughs> musicians. Is, yeah, yeah. I mean, earlier this year, I went to Anguilla in the Virgin Islands and did a, did a blues international blues show there with a, a lot of different musicians. Yeah. Anguilla was the place that the tornado hit. Right. Decimated the island. That, well, that was an interesting thing too. A completely different culture working working with those people. First time I played reggae in my life. Ah. Huh. Yeah, I can see you playing reggae. <laughs> I, I can now. I couldn't get my head around it. I worked with a, a, a reggae band and they said, and, you know, that it was there may be five drummers in the band, and that, we, I, got, I got the idea pretty quickly. <laughs> so, so are, are you related to Robin Hood since that's that's where you were born? Or <laughs> well, I must be indirectly. Yes, Mansfield, Nottinghamshire, right yeah. in the centre of Sherwood Forest. You've got the moustache. <laughs> yes, yeah. I don't know whether oh, maybe the original Robin had a moustache. I'm not sure, but certainly Errol Flynn did. Errol Flynn, yeah, he was my favourite. <laughs> Yeah, he was the best Robin Hood, I think. That's interesting, isn't it? Yeah. No, I, I think I think I have a Welsh connection too. My my great uncle was an opera singer under under the name of Morgan Kingston, which is a, a very Welsh name, although he wasn't actually Welsh. But the interesting story is when he uh, he was very successful and uh, on Columbia, CBS Columbia Records at, at the time and. I think he was in the Metropolitan Opera Company in New York, and he did a show for Woodrow Wilson, President Wilson. Oh, wow. And President Wilson gave him a, a Welsh harp, a gold statue of a, a, let me get this right, an American eagle playing a Welsh harp. <laughs> Jeez. So he thought, obviously thought he was Welsh too, but... <laughs> Yeah, it's funny. I always had a uh, something in me about England, maybe in another life or something. You know, I've always well, been. I mean, most most of, unless you're a Native American, you probably came from your ancestors. Probably came from somewhere else. 
Um, most Americans are immigrants, aren't they? So it, yeah. It did. Well, my ancestors came from my mother's side came from Spain, and yeah. uh, and my father's side came from Syria. So I got quite a mixture in me there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, most most people in the UK are immigrants. You know, going back yeah. foot much further than American immigrants, but we're all immigrants. I'm Irish. I come from Ireland. Yeah. So. Yeah, but you know what? Brits are cool. You know, I mean, you got the, the history with the the knights and. You know the castles and all that stuff. That's that's awesome. <laughs> well, it is. Yeah, and, and, you know, America tends to, you know, if it's fifty years old, then they knock it down and build another one, don't they? Yeah, I know. Isn't that a shame? <laughs> I saw my, my, my McDonald's being knocked down in in Nashville. Or what, you know, my local area of Nashville, where I live, and I thought, what's going to happen there? And then they built another McDonald's. Yeah, I know. <laughs> It was it was built so badly in the first place. I think it was about be cheaper to rebuild it than repair it. So the guy said. But. Yeah, I hate when we knock down uh, famous venues. You know, like. Uh, oh, I know. Isn't uh, that awful? Oh, it's terrible. I, I, I was. I've, I've got a piece of the floor from Stax Records. Really. The old Stax Studio, the old cinema floor. I was, I was in Memphis when they were knocking it down, and uh, it was awful. And now they've built a replica. Yeah. Well, didn't, didn't they knock down uh, the, uh, oh gosh, the Cavern Club, the original Cavern Club, right? Now they yes. got a, yes, they got a replica. Did. Yeah. There's a thing in Cardiff right now where they're knocking down a local venue. They're talking and knocking it down, and people are protesting against it. It's become very political, trying to save these buildings. It, it happens everywhere. RCA, the RCA studios right. on, on Music Row in Nashville, they were going to knock it down to develop apartments, of course. That's usually the thing. I hate that. Um, the, the original Marquee Club, they knocked down that apartment. Oh, man. That's terrible. That's horrible. Woodstock stayed. Yeah. <laughs> in Woodstock stayed. That's, that's something. Although the, the amphitheater is not on the same spot that the actual yeah. festival was, but it, it's it's still there. I guess one day they'll knock... Wars, of course, went... I think the thing is that music usually is in some downtrodden areas. Right, right. Down and, uh, because, it, it, you know, it's cheaper to rent an old cinema or an old hall than to go right into some l latest art center. And, uh, yeah. But, I, guess, uh, I guess one day they'll knock down uh, Abbey Road Studios. That would be horrible. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't think they'll do that. I think that's too established. Yeah. You know, and if you go, if you go up... Um, up to up the Mississippi to Clarksdale, Clarksville. Right. I always get the two mixed up. Clarksville. Right. It's Clarksville, isn't it? No. Clarksdale, Mississippi. The Blues Museum there, they, they, they've done a little bit more work on it. But when I first went there, there was very little in there because blues musicians of, of that ilk really didn't have that much to put in the museum, did they? That's right. Probably a, a bit of wood from Muddy Waters shack. <laughs> You know, a lot of Led Zeppelin's material came from all that. <laughs> you did, and they had to pay, too. Yeah. I mean, subliminally or whatever, I think they had to pay out some, um, you know, um, writing legal. You know, they, 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 they kind of yes, they, they they ripped off uh, the small faces a lot, too. You know that? I, I didn't realize that till later. You know, like a whole lot of love came from the small faces. I mean, I, I, I mean, most of the time now I can hear the first verse of a song and, sit and, and sing the melody for the bridge and the chorus. Because you know, where there's so much, I mean, particularly modern music, it's so generic, isn't it? That, um, yes. And, I, you know, and I've noticed that more, as I said, I, I, since I've been learning to sing or improving my singing, whatever, I can kind of hit the notes a little bit better. And I, I think, wow. That's what it's all about. Yeah. It, it's not like shooting in the dark. It's, ju it's just picking a melody that's pretty generic. Exactly. So 
I don't know. It's, it's difficult to say, isn't it? I mean, my sweet lord, you know the George Harrison Oh, yeah, song. definitely. He's so fine, and my sweet lord, I know that's not <laughs> a very famous one that George paid out on. <laughs> yeah, that's I, obvious. I, I, you know, I didn't know George very well, but I don't think he was the type of person no. to just go in blatantly rip something off. I it, think he, it's a subliminal thing that happens. Yeah, he didn't have to. I, and a lot of the songs that I've written, and my wife will say, she hears a record, she said, that's, that's, they ripped off that song. That song of yours, and I said, I don't think so. It just sounds a bit like it. Right, right. But well, there's, you know, there's so much music out there, it's going to happen. You, you can't help it. Of course it is. Yeah. Yeah, and we're sampling now. Yeah, that's right. All these programs. I saw, I saw a computer program the other week that I looked at, and it was how to write a song. And you, you, you put this thing in, and they ask you, think of a, how do you feel? And they give you six different words, and blah, blah, blah. Um, think of a place, and it gives you the thing, and suggestions. You put these things in, and then it says, what genre do you want to write in? And you put blues or rock, or I put Taylor Swift. <laughs> and he wrote the song, came back with the lyrics like a Taylor Swift song. <laughs> Unbelievable. <laughs> I, I apologize to Taylor. Who I do know <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, to, with, with that kind of thing available, and, you know, the, the fact that you can cut and paste, and you, you've got yeah. computer programs that play the bass for you, and the guitar, and the keyboards, things are going to sound pretty much the same. I know, it's a shame, isn't it? But it's it's very s static and square, it doesn't, it doesn't have, doesn't, a lot of the time it doesn't have, seem to have soul. They don't. A lot, of, a lot of the pop stuff, it's, some of the, there's some great people out there, very talented people out there. Um, but the way they, often the way they approach songwriting and singing and songs, I can't do it. I cannot do it because I, I come from a different thing. Right. I guess that's music for the young, you know, young people who have a different way of doing things. And, and I'm sure, I know for a fact when I started playing as a rule, musician that knew three chords and wanted to play like bass like Ray Brown um, I'm sure those guys thought what are these guys they're getting paid for doing nothing they're rubbish yeah that's so, true you know you have to you have to look at things that way but uh, no I, I wouldn't complain about, I, I complain about the restrictiveness of, of music now where people won't play I mean they won't play They'll play a, a new artist, providing they've got the push, you know, from the record label and blah, 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 blah. But they won't play, a, a lot of the time, they won't play an old established artist because, right. you know, it doesn't fit in with the idea of, uh, their idea of you for, you know, it doesn't give kudos to a, a, an A&R man to sign mm. some guy that's been successful for 10 years or 20 years or 50 years or however long. They tend to, um, they want to look for something new all the time. It's got to be new, it's got to be new. Um, I think that, that's a pity, but I think it's always been like that. Um, what, one shouldn't complain. I've had a good run, you know, I mean, I didn't, I thought when I was 25 I was too old. <laughs> yeah, I heard you in an interview say that. <laughs> yeah, I, know, I did, I stopped, I thought. I mean, it was the time, what was happening at the time, Rainbow and... Um, right. Yeah, it was Rainbow and what was the other band? Um, I can't think, but the bands like that were around. And I, Rainbow in particular, I was asked if I wanted to join and um, I thought, I don't want to go out on the road now. I, you know, it's not my thing. It's not, not really the yeah. kind of thing. But yeah, some of the guys in Rainbow that, that I, I, I knew, Don Harry and uh, Cozy Powell and, um, oh golly, the singer. The singer, what was the singer? One of the singers in Rainbow. Golly, I'm terrible on names, do you know? <laughs> <laughs> I, th I thought they were brilliant. I just thought I was too old. And, and I was making records for other people, so I kind of did that. But, um, so I thought, it's, you know, some, it, don't you think that perhaps some old people should, so one guy said to me, why don't you pack up and give someone else a chance? Jeez, <laughs> oh, gotta be kidding me! Better, I think. Yeah, <laughs> gotta be kidding me. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. But no, no, it's, um, 
The uh, the singers you were thinking about, uh, uh, J- Ronnie James Dio and uh, Joe Ronnie, Lynn Turner. Yeah, Ronnie. Yeah, yeah. And Joe Lynn Turner. To, 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 to Ronnie died. Yeah, yeah, he was good. He was brilliant. Yeah. And uh, you know, I, 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 when I was offered a job with Rainbow, I didn't know Ronnie, but subsequently I did know him. But, um, you must have known Richie, right? So, yes, that's yeah. right. Yeah. I think it was Richie, Cozy, Ronnie, and um, John Airy, I think. Cozy was a great drummer. He was a great drummer. <clears throat> yeah. yeah. I played on... Cozy and I were going to put a band together at one yeah. stage. But it didn't work out. Yeah, I saw Cozy in concert. He had his own band. Yes, he did. Yep. I think he had a band called Bethlehem, didn't he? Yeah, he was good. Well, great band. He was good. Yeah. And Don Airy, I've worked with Don, played on on one of my right. records. Not, not the under 70 split. I had a band before that. Don was in that and we toured together. So it's always the same guys keep... Um, yeah, Don's in Deep Purple now. But... Um, yeah, it was around that time that I kind of thought I was too old and quit. Huh. Well, well, don't quit. Your music is awesome. We need we need seasoned <laughs> rock stars. I don't we know need... what else I do. Um, I think my <laughs> wife said that I'd just be boring. <laughs> and I probably would because I'm boring anyway. I don't really do much other than <laughs> play music. But uh, no, I love it. I, I, I feel animated. You know, I think it, it gives me energy <laughs> to do. You know, to do what you love. I mean, no. I, I, I'm sure that's. That's what the secret of life, isn't it? It is. Do what you love, it if is. you can, and if you're lucky enough to do it, appreciate it. You know, so many people are in dead end jobs and they hate where they work. You know, they are. They are. Yeah. I, I, you know, I've had good times and bad times, and I remember one of the bad times. My bank manager said, "Oh, I wish I was like you. I've got such a good job and a pension coming. I don't do the things that you do." Right. That's right. when I was trying to get an, an overdraft or trying to continue <laughs> with an overdraft. <laughs> no, like, or, or you get in a band, for, for example, and you, you want to do something new and you stay with the band because, you know, it's a good living and what else can I do? Yeah. You know, you keep a lot of people do that throughout the whole life. What, were you friends with uh, Uriah Heat? Yes. Yeah. I I uh I covered uh Uriah Heap recently at uh, the House of Blues and hung out with Mick and inter- okay, I did yeah, an interview with Mick. They did a US tour, didn't they? Yeah, Mick Mick finished doing a tour now. He um, looks good. Mick looks really great. Good. Yeah, they're yeah. doing really well. In fact, I think they're doing better than ever. It's not the same though. I I I grew up with the original Uriah Heap and I I just it's not the same for me. <laughs> you know? Say that about any band. Yeah. You know? Now you, it's, you remember the original I lineup, don't you? And, uh, I was a, I was a, a uh, David Byron fan, so uh, yeah, yeah. But I I, I still talk to uh, Lee uh, Lee well, Kerslake. They did a show at, at um, I'm just trying to think where it was Hammersmith Odeon, I think, uh-huh. in London. A show in London quite recently, a week or so ago. And Lee got up on stage. Uh, with... He's a good guy. He was the right one of the main writers in the band, wasn't he? Yes, he was. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I remember them. I remember them coming through. Well, Leo, they were uh, with a, a small label called Bronze when they first. Yeah. And, and a friend of mine was Bronze the, the, the guy that signed them. Yep. Dave, David Braun, I think, wasn't he the uh, the main guy there? The Braun mm-hmm. Records. Yeah. Yeah. That's Leo, right. Leo, I want to thank you so much, man, for being on the show today. It, it's a real pleasure. Oh, thank you. It's a pleasure. Uh, we, we look. I look forward to more great music. Uh, hopefully, you'll make it to the states because we we really miss you over here. I hope so too. I'd love to come over. Um, you know, they were talking about. Oh, maybe you could come over and do. You know, the, we're going to do a Woodstock thing, and I talked with Michael Lang. You know, the guy that did sure. the original one. Yeah. But I think it's like a. a I don't know whether Live Nation are doing it or whatever now, and, and they're right. to put you know current bands on and new name bands on and all sorts of things. So I don't know, I don't know what what would happen, but uh, maybe you never know. I got, if I, I got, can get my if I can get my permission.
permission to enter the United States. I'll, I'll do that. <laughs> I got to ask you, how did where did you come up with the name Hundred Seventy Split? Well, um, it was when we were, we were making. You missed one album that actually. The first the first album we made was called The World Won't Stop. Right. And we recorded it in Nashville. And I live on Highway Hundred. Oh, Highway Seventy. Okay. I, on, I, I had a house on Highway Seventy. Okay. That makes sense. And, and 170 split is where Highway 100 and Highway 70 split. Gotcha. It, it starts off as Broadway and runs up through Nashville, to, and right. then Highway 100 becomes Highway 71, and the split goes off to Highway 100. I got you. That makes sense. <laughs> yeah. And there's a lot of uh, urban legend, too, about the name 10 years after. I, that, what, you, I, I need you to clear that one up. <laughs> Um, yeah, this is a difficult one because we used to say anything that came in the top of the house, but it, in actual fact, I, I came up with the name. I was looking through a newspaper and, and there was an advertisement for a book about the Suez Canal. Okay. 1956, you know, the invasion of the Suez yes. Canal by the Britain? I do. NASA, NASA closed off the Suez Canal and stopped the boat, so Britain invaded. It was a disaster. But it was the book was called Suez 10 years later. Okay. 10 years after, rather. Gotcha. And I thought, 10 years after, it's a good name for a band. And I, I ran it by the, the manager. We just got a new manager. Who, who, he said, you've got to change your name. And um, I ran it by him, and I ran it by the band, and they said, yeah, I think that's good. So we became 10 years after. Thanks to you. <laughs> but we said it was 10 years after rock and roll and all sorts of things. But the truth is, I, I just saw it was a, a book title. Right. Well, you, you made some great music over the years, and we thank you for that, Leo. Sorry, you're going a bit fine. Uh You made some incredible music over the years, and you're still making incredible music, and we, we, we all thank you for that. Well, thank you. I, I appreciate people still listening to it. Um, we do our best, and our best is yet to come. That's what I tell myself. There you go. Well, stay stay in touch so we can uh, follow up with the uh, the next album and the Woodstock thing. Okay. Well, email me your um, a postal address, and it, it may be after Christmas now because the mail's crazy, right. but I'll, I'll send you some of the other stuff. I appreciate that. Yeah, I'd be, I'd be pleased. Thank you, Leo. Have a, have a happy holiday also and a great new year. The same to you, and thanks, and hi to everybody that's listening. I, okay, cheers. <laughs> All right. Bye-bye, Leo. For more information about Leo Lyons, visit www.leolyons.org, www.facebook.com backslash leo.lyons.98, uh, also www.10070split.co.uk, or for 10 Years After information, www.10yearsafternow. Dot com. Very special thanks to the dynamic duo of Doug and Don Newsom of BBS Radio for making the magic happen for each and every broadcast of Interviewing the Legends. If you have comments or suggestions for the show, contact me at interviewingthelegends at gmail.com. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel, uh, Interviewing the Legends with Ray Shasho, for the very latest interviews. It's real news, people. Also, don't forget to purchase a copy of my book entitled Check the G's, The True Story of an Eclectic American Family and Their Wacky Family Business, available now at Amazon.com. There's a kind of like a movie trailer about the book. It's on YouTube. Uh, it's called Check the G's. Please look at that, and you will learn more about the book. Also, stay tuned. The Rockstar Chronicles. That's going to be my latest book. Uh, I'll fill you in on that as we get closer. It's currently in production. Have a great week, everybody. Thank you, everybody, for listening to Interviewing the Legends. Brought to you by the Publicity Works Agency. Call 941-877-1552 or visit us at publicityworksagency.com specializing in author and music artist publicity plans. 
We shine when we make you shine. Tune in to Interviewing the Legends every Tuesday at 7 p.m. Pacific Time on BBS Radio, Station 1.